um, event is one of the many that are to come um, to push forward women in STEM, which is a very important initiative. So we thought today by getting you all together and having this wonderful group of panelists for you to ask questions to, that kind of stimulates discussion and might spark something in you as far as where you want to go in, in STEM. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction about all of our panelists. Forgive me, I'm in advising brain, so I stumble over my words, that's why. Um, our first panelist at the table is Joanne Pelletier, a BCC uh, native. <laughs> She's a Vice President of Information Technology Services here at BCC. She's been with the college since 1998, began her career here as the Director of Administrative Computing and Information Services, and currently holds the Vice President for IT Services position here. Um, she began her college career at BCC, where she completed her Associates in Computer Programming. Then she went on to Rhode Island College and got a BS in Computer Information Systems, as well as a BA in Computer Science. Went to Boston University and graduated with a Master's in Computer Information Systems, and has been here since then. Um, Rosemary Barrett comes to us from Novartis um, in Cambridge. She is a Scientist One in the Department of Oncology. Prior to coming to Novartis, she worked at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She graduated from Bridgewater State in 2005 with a BS in Biology with a Molecular Biology concentration. And the third panel is, do you go by Katie or Catherine? Katie Pratt. Um, I have her CV. She's got a very impressive CV. Right now, she works in the Office of Marine Programs at the University of Rhode Island. Her specific area of interest is in the Deep Carbon Observatory. Um, just a little bit about, she's a very well-rounded individual. Um, she works with the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Um, she has a, this is your website, right? KDPhD.com. She's founder, writer, and editor of this website. Also of Benchfly.com, um, BrainPages.org. She's a contributor. Um, she got her PhD in 2012 from Brown University, the Department of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry. Um, she has a number of publications and wonderful journals, and she's going to give you some information about how she got to where she is today. Um, Faith Ball is the Engineering Senior Manager at Lockheed Martin. Is it Sipican? Yep. So, okay, that was very good. Slot of work. Um, she's been working in the field of engineering since graduating from URI in 1983 with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Prior to her current position, um, she participated in the design and production of diverse products, including the B-2 stealth bomber, underwater vehicles and sensors, radar systems test equipment, and support services and fiber optic gyros. So, pretty nice. And Vanessa um, Collars. Collars. Collars is product manager and design engineer with Mar Federal. She's been with Mar Federal since 2008, where she currently holds the position of product manager and design engineer. Prior to her position at Mar Federal, she worked as an engineering designer for Sapphire Engineering for seven years. She's a 2006 BCC graduate with her associates in engineering technology, specializing in mechanical engineering. So one last round of applause. If you just came in and you would like a card, we've, we recommend that as you think of questions for the panelists, you jot them down so if someone else is talking or they're talking, you know, you remember what you're going to ask. each of our um, panelists to just tell a little bit about how they came to uh, become involved in their program. So if we can start with Joanne first. Down there. Start with the BCC person down there and then we'll just work our way across. Um, if there's a question, again, let's go ahead and get through the panelists and then certainly we're going to have adequate time for all kinds of questions. Also, if you do come back over with us to the Ice Cream Social, that's going to be a great opportunity to really delve into um, considerable more conversation with anybody here that you want to learn a little bit more about what they did. So, please join us. Good afternoon. My name is Joanne Paltier. I've been at the college for about 15 years. And as I was thinking about today, I was thinking, you know, I think the room was potentially a different room or posted different. But then when I saw, oh, B120, 
when I think about B120, I think about my career here as a student because this classroom, which was actually bigger, we just we just subdivided this room recently. The room was bigger. I don't think there was any carpeting um, at the time, but this is where I started my career as a technology person. This is where all the computer, or most of the computer classes were held prior to the building next door's K building being built. And as they were transitioning to K building, this was the primary classroom that we used. There was none of this technology stuff because it was all much different back then. But um, I'm back here 27 years later. That was in 1986. When I was young, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I came from a single parent home. But my uncle, he, was, he worked for digital. And back then, the, the computers were the size of this room. And you know, I frequently visit during holidays, and my cousins were exposed to technology. They had you know these terminals that would hook up to digital equipment and stuff like that. And they ended up, I must, it must have been probably early 80s, say 1983 or so. They had this IBM PC Junior. It wasn't just a big one like you might have seen back in the day, or for some of you probably weren't even born yet. But there was, it was a, it was a little, it was a little mini. PC that was meant for children, and I thought to myself, wow, this is, you know, at first I might have thought I was going to be a hairdresser, but then I said, maybe this is the career for me. <laughs> so I became intrigued in the whole technology, and back then it was more only, you know, it was only programming because there wasn't the networks that you see, you know, in the, in the technology, wireless, you know, phones, all the stuff that we have today, but I thought about the potential of maybe becoming a computer programmer. I had the good fortune or maybe not so good fortune, that I was eligible to um, get a summer job through CETA, which was a program in the area in many cities that would employ young people from low-income families to, to have summer jobs. And I was fortunate to get this job at my high school where half the day, it was a, it was a full-time summer job, between I believe it was my freshman and sophomore year, that I would actually sit in a classroom and learn about basic programming and then the other half of the day, we would do some work on the school's computers, doing you know entry of students and things like that. That was my first exposure to programming computers. And that's when I decided that's what I was going to do for good. I decided right in ninth grade, that's what I was going to do. My options, you know, I probably didn't have too many options because my mom didn't have lots of money. I probably could have gone to UMass Dartmouth, but I really liked BCC. So I started in 1986. And you know, some of my faculty are here in the room because they stay for a long period of time. And you know, at first I was a traditional age student, so I was having a lot of fun. You know, it, it, I was you know not necessarily as serious as I probably should have been initially. But then the light went off. You know, I wanted to have a good life for myself. I didn't want to have. I didn't want to fall into the same situation that my mother had fallen into. So then I got really serious, and I turned myself around and said, "Heck." you know, I'm going to transfer, and I'm going to transfer to Rhode Island College in computer information systems, which is more of a businessy focus. But then I get there and I say, for an additional year, I can actually get a computer science degree. So I said, what the heck? I might as well stay for an additional year. Um, so then I decided to get both the math influence degree and the business influence degree, which I think probably was the best thing that I could have ever done because those classes were very different. I would go to the CIS classes and they'd be businessy type students, but then I'd go to the classes that were computer science and it would be real all out math type students, you know, what you might consider, you know, geeks at the time. Those were the students that were really into the technology piece. So as I was graduating, or while I was still at that college, Rhode Island College, I was fortunate to get a job at the college doing some programming, which I would highly recommend. That's like the, the biggest thing that you could ever do. College is a great experience, but getting some experience while you're still in college will show prospective employers that you're serious about what you do, that you're interested in the field and you really want to get a job. So I was offered my first job. And this company had gone around to all the colleges in the area, Bryant, you know, all of them. And I got a job offer in February. And it was going to be a programming job. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. OK, so what am I going to do? Is this really what I want to do? So I actually turned that job down. Because they wanted a commitment in writing right then and there in February. So then I graduated. And no jobs came. <laughs> so, I didn't, so I didn't take that job. So, 
and it was okay, because I had just graduated, and, and you know, I was just getting back to being used to being at home, and so on and so forth. And so then, multiple jobs came in at the same time. I was offered a job in August, and I literally, it was another programming job. I decided, I'm going to take this job. Then I realized, I'm probably more of a person that will work with programmers versus actually sitting in a room programming. I decided that job was not for me. So then, it was another month or two and I was offered another job, this time at a college, not Bristol Community College, but at a college. And that's where I found my calling. Working at a college keeps you feeling like you're in education and that's really been the best thing that I could have ever done. I still have my hands in technology and I have to, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, it's really good working in technology at a college. You know, it's not really like working in a business. I can tell you it's actually probably even worse because instead of just your company that you might be managing a network of, say, 200 employees, we have the potential of 9,000 people here doing whatever they might be doing on our network, so on and so forth. So it's actually a very challenging environment to be able to keep everything running where you have, you know, many, many people coming in and out. And that's how I've gotten here today. It's been a wonderful path for me. I really like being in education. I like the fact that I'm around new technology all the time and get to, you know, work with people that are still learning technology. I really enjoy um, hiring some of our students. In fact, I'm doing an infographic for any of you that know what an infographic is. It's the newest thing. You go on the web and there'll be pictures of just charts and things that will show you percentages and stuff. And I thought to myself, what are some good infographics about, about my department? Some of them being how many times people log into systems and things like that. But then I thought to myself, gee, you know, my department hired, and I didn't look it up yet, my department probably has 75% of it staffed with Bristol Community College alums. And I would probably say that of that, we probably have the least amount of turnover in the whole institution, I would have to say. We like it, we stay, we think it's good. One other thing I'd like to mention um, in terms of being a woman in this field, and it is not necessarily the most traditional thing, and I did a quick, you know, there are, there are 24 public, there are state universities and community colleges in Massachusetts, there are 15 community colleges, and in my position, there are three females of the 15. And for the state university, which would be like Bridgewater State University, Fitchburg, and Framingham, there's one out of nine that are females. So that totals 17, so 17 percent of the 24 state and community colleges are females. And it's interesting, I, I have the longest tenure, I'm not that old, although I am. <laughs> I have the longest tenure of all of them. I have the longest staying power, but it is, you, it is, it is a difficult thing to break into in terms of managing technologists being a woman. I'm not going to say that it isn't. Um, it certainly is. So that's my story. Very nice. <laughs> we wanted to Rosie. Sure. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Rosie. Nice to meet you. Um, so my road to science was not direct. Actually, um, when I graduated high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was only 16 years old. Um, well, I wanted to be a musician, but amazingly, that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up just going to university, kind of following in my brother's footsteps. I did geography. I wasn't super into it, but it was just something, you know, to kind of get the wheels turning. And after three years, I decided I, you know, I wasn't super interested in it. And rather than just continuing to go and pursue that, I decided to take some time off. And I actually ended up getting a job in that field for about four years. Um, but then I, I kept thinking, well, what is it that I really love? What is it that I really love? And it, it didn't come easy to me, but eventually I decided that I wanted to try to go to veterinary school. So then what I did was I went to Mount Ida College because they have a vet tech program. And I thought that that would be a nice stepping stone into like a pre-vet kind of program. And then after my first year doing that, I discovered that I was terrified of cats. <laughs> I just got like, really terrified. So I thought, no way I can do this, you know. And but you know, at the at the time, I was taking some pretty advanced science courses, um, which is kind of uh, like a prerequisite for the program, and um, and I loved it. And I started to really fall in love with biology, and so I transferred to Bridgewater State University, 
and I started um, in their biology program, and um, I ended up graduating there. I, I had to move to California for certain reasons, but um, I ended up graduating um, from Bridgewater State University, um, finishing my credits in California. And the, the best part about my experience at Bridgewater State was the uh, independent research project that I got to do. Um, so I would uh, say if you ever have an opportunity to do something like that, uh, in addition to your coursework, that was uh, certainly the most valuable experience for me, um, where I got to do some of my own research. I applied for a small grant on my own, and you know anything like that that you can add to your resume um, was a huge help for me when I graduated. Um, but when I did graduate, I did have a really hard time getting that first job. It was, it, was, it was a challenge. And so for some reason, I just knew that I wanted to work in cancer research. And I also knew that I wanted to work at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Now, I'm in California, and so I'm applying to a job at Dana-Farber in Boston, and I put in 27 resumes. Uh, and I got one call. And um, I remember when I got the call, I was house-sitting for a friend in Big Bear, which was like kind of in the mountains, and I was on my cell phone, and they called me, mm -hmm. and they were breaking up, and I was like, you know, who is this? And they're like, oh, you know, we, we got your resume, uh, are you still interested in the position, you know, research position at Dana-Farber? I was like, yes! And she's breaking up, and, and, you know, I'm trying to get all this information, and she's, and then I lost the call, and they never called back. <laughs> And it was just like, it was, you know, it was so heartbreaking because I really wanted to, to work there. And so I bought a ticket to Boston and I just left. I, I went there and I thought, you know, if that's where I want, I know I want to work there or somewhere around there. And Boston is, you know, a really good place for this field. Um, you know, I'm just going to have to go and I'm going to have to start knocking on doors, so to speak. And so uh, eventually I did land an interview at Dana-Farber. And um, I was waitressing at the time, and I remember thinking, you know, I just, I, I really want this job. Like, this is my dream job. I really want it. And when I was in the interview, they told me, which I don't think is, is typical, but they told me, you know, that there were a lot of people that were applying and that most of them were from Harvard. And I was like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> great, because Harvard has such a good reputation, you know, and Bridgewater State is an amazing school, but I just, I kind of thought that, you know, maybe I didn't have a chance, but you know, at some point in the interview, I was able to really convey my passion for the subject matter and for what they were doing in their lab. It was, it was genuinely interesting to me. And I think they sensed that. Um, and so it was nine weeks later that they called me back. <laughs> um, they did call me back and I got, I got my first job. So, I mean, you know, I fought for it, but um, I couldn't have ended up in a better place. And so I worked there for about three and a half years. And eventually, I was at a crossroads. Again, I was thinking, well, you know, there wasn't, there's not a lot of upward mobility at Dana-Farber for a technician. So I thought, well, I either need to get a PhD or I need to look into industry. And at that time, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But all I knew was that I loved the bench science. Like, I loved being at the bench. And I was, you know, so I applied at Novartis. Um, and this time only once, and because of my experience and uh, the research I've been doing, I got the job, and so I've been there for three and a half years, and um, I've never looked back. I absolutely love what I do. I'm in the Department of Oncology there, and so we're coming up with novel therapeutics to uh, treat cancer, and um, it's very rewarding. So, that's it. <laughs> I have the president here. <laughs> we wanted to, he's, he's going between several meetings today, so we are, we're actually going to bring him in very quickly to do a quick welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. I asked uh, Megan if I could just interrupt. I'm sorry for the interruption, but uh, Greg and I wanted to send our uh, uh, best wishes to this group, and uh, this first. Uh, first kind of activity for this group, I think, as I understand it, and uh, uh, it's something so important to the college that we uh, encourage women, everybody for that matter, but certainly women, are going to the STEM fields and uh, 
you hear some wonderful stories from uh, people that are very successful with it. Uh, and I hope that you will consider uh, moving into that field as well as a world of opportunity available for you. And please know that you have uh, the support of BCC. We stand behind you and ready to uh, support you in any way that we can. So uh, it's very good of you. Your attendance here speaks volumes about the interest. Uh, and uh, again, I want to thank Megan. And Megan's the first to say other people were involved uh, in organizing this event, but uh, uh, it was her leadership that really brought people to it. And I thank you. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll have many more of these. Thanks very much. Uh, a quick hello, Greg Sotheris. I'm the acting vice president for academic affairs. Uh, I have a, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got a red dot because I was a math major. Um, and, I, and I will say for for uh, some of the people here who are some of the women who are thinking about going into math, science, engineering, or what have you, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a barren field out there. We've got so many examples here and in the audience. Yes, our excited, excitable math faculty member. Uh, my master's program that I was in years ago uh, had more women in it than men. Now, I think that that was the aberration. Maybe that was the reason I went to that program. I'm not sure. <laughs> Either way, uh, keep the faith. Uh, it is a wonderful vocation, be it engineering or IT or what have you. Uh, and all the best. And it's 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 a tough road, but it's it's worth it. So enjoy it. Thank you. I appreciate you guys taking that moment, and uh, we'll pass it on to Katie. <laughs> Hi. So um, so I'm a science writer and science communicator. Um, I don't actually do science anymore, um, but I did for a very long time. So um, what I do now bears very little. Uh, re relevance to what I thought I was going to be doing. Uh, when I was about 16, I first went into a science lab. Um, my aunt was a scientist, and she kind of showed me all the stuff that they did in the lab. And It wasn't really the science that got me excited, it was what I was actually doing, the, tech, the techniques that I was using. It, just, it was really kind of fun. Um, so I decided to go to university um, in England. Obviously, I'm not from around here. Um, <laughs> I went to university um, and got my bachelor's degree in biochemistry. Um, and while I was doing my degree, I did um, an independent study project, which kept the fire alive. I still wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to go that route. But by the time I graduated, I, I guess I took a moment and I thought, well, th like, this is a going straight to a PhD program seemed a little daunting for a second there. Um, so I took a job as a technician. But just to make it a little more exciting, I did that job in the US. So that's when I first moved to Rhode Island. And I worked as a technician um, in a lab at Brown University. And um, I was really lucky in that I was given independent work to do a lot of technician work and just be very much keeping the lab running. But they actually let me have an independent project. And I was working on, um, on antibiotic research, which was really fascinating to me and honestly I really wish I'd never left that lab but that's a different story. So um, by the spring I decided I, I, did, I did want to get my PhD, I did want to be a scientist and at the time the career advice I was getting was well you have to do a PhD then. So I applied to a ton of programs in the States and I got an interview at one, Brown. <laughs> so I guess that was uh, my first indication in life that networking is really important. Um, so I took I took the I took the um, the position. I, I became a student in the uh, molecular biology, cell biology, and biochemistry department at Brown, um, which is a it's a great department. And um, I, the first thing that they do is they send you out and you do three rotations through three different labs in the department. I ended up picking um, the lab that I thought was the most technically challenging because apparently I like things to be hard. So I, I joined this lab and um, uh, one of the things I thought was cool was that, you know, one of the challenges was we were working on um, oocytes from frog ovaries. So the beginning of every day pretty much was go and collect a frog from the animal care facility, take it back to the lab, open it up, pull out its ovaries, uh, and then sew it back up so that you could use the rest of the ovaries another time. 
So anyway, that was just to start of the day. Like science hadn't even begun. This was veterinary surgery. So um, anyway, oh, you're squeamish. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Oh, no, science I'm science way back. Um, anyway, so so that partially explains to you why it took me seven years to complete my PhD, um, which I did last summer, which was amazing. Um, it was a huge relief, and the reason it was such a relief is that about five years in, I had a kind of a massive nervous breakdown and, and thought, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So this whole career trajectory that I had been on suddenly stopped feeling right for me. I had panic attacks, I was freaking out, I was like, I can't, I can't, I don't have the stomach for this lifestyle. And the reasons behind that are some things that you may well have seen in the press lately about how funding for basic science is being slashed left and right, which means that um, academic positions are extremely, extremely competitive, um, funding is extremely competitive, um, and just, you know, just even getting a job is, you know, one in a million effectively. So I just took a look around me at all the other, particularly at the women around me, and what it was taking from them to actually continue a career in science, and I just thought, this is absolutely not what I want. I don't want to spend 24 hours a day focused on one single project trying to squeeze money out of the government. <laughs> so I know that sounds depressing, but what it did do was it made me think about what it is I love about science and, 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 and what I could do with my education to still stay um, in science. And my favorite thing about science is understanding how the world works. Um, it doesn't have to be just one little project. I, I'm interested in everything, which, of course, was another reason it took me seven years to graduate. But um, <laughs> So in the midst of my panic, um, I, I turned to a, a part of my life that I had kind of neglected, and that was the creative side of my life. And I realized that if I could turn my enthusiasm for science and my understanding of science into a written communication, or any other form of communication, but at the time, written communication seemed like the easiest way to go, then I could you know, create a career for myself, in effect. Um, I knew science writing was this mysterious profession that you could um, do, but I didn't know how on earth you went about doing it. So I figured step one was to write about science. So um, in 2010, I started my own blog, um, which has now morphed into more of a full website. Um, and I would set goals for myself every week. I would write two articles and I would post them to my blog. And um, as I started to improve, I started to reach out to other members of the science writing community. And the way I did this was very simple. I made a Twitter account. And, um, and I reached out to all these other science writers online and basically said, hey, can you, can you read what I'm writing? Can I get some feedback? Can you tell me if I'm any good? And so over the last two or three years, I've built a, a huge network of friends now who, um, uh, through the Science Online community, um, which I would encourage you to look into if you have a presence on Twitter, or even if you don't, there, um, if you go to scienceonline.org, I think, every year they have an annual conference, but throughout the rest of the year there's a lot of vibrant um, chats on various different hashtags and things, and that's really how I started to build a network. And so, when I finally came to graduate last uh, summer, I, was, I knew that this is what I was going to do. I was going to write about science. Um, I was going to communicate science. I was going to, you know, just get the word out that science is cool. And, um, but it turned out there really weren't very many jobs. So what I did was I started freelancing. So um, I, as uh, I've forgotten your name, Katie oh, mentioned. Um, right, forget your name, Katie. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I worked, um, I covered uh, meetings for the New York Stem Cell Foundation, I wrote a huge report for them, um, I worked for various blogs, um, I, I, you know, used a lot of those contacts I'd made to Science Online, and I blogged for nature.com, um, really just did everything that I possibly could for as much money as anyone wanted to pay me to do it. And then, at the same time, I did keep plugging away, trying to find a full-time job. And in about uh, September of last year, I saw a job posting for the job that I now have. 
and it was at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and I remembered that I had actually last summer sat on a panel at University of Rhode Island talking about science and social media. And so I was like, I bet I know someone at URI who's involved in this job. So I shot um, Sunshine an email and, um, and applied for the job. And after a few interviews, I got offered the job. And so that's really, in a nutshell, how I got there. And so I wanted to share with you just four morals of my story so far. The first is networking is really, really important. I can't emphasize that enough. The old adage of it's not what you know, it's who you know is absolutely 100% true and you should always keep that in mind. Um, second of all, it may seem like I just kind of fell into this job and I was lucky, but the luck favors you know, those who keep an open mind. So while you're here and you're focusing on science and technology and math, keep up with all your hobbies and all the other things that you think are unimportant to your career because you never know what skill set an employer will want. I, my employer loves that I can draw and tweet, so you never know. <laughs> um, so the third one is, um, you really don't need an advanced degree to do what I do, but it really helps. So. Um, Many science writers have a master's or a PhD. Um, many don't. There's some wonderful success stories, for, like Carl Zimmer, for example, or um, Brian Zweitek. But really, the advantage to me for having a PhD is not necessarily that I know all this stuff, because my PhD was in a very narrow field. And I now I'm a biologist by training, and I write about geology and chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does help me do is it helps me understand the scientists that I'm communicating to and with. Um, it really helps me understand their lives, their lingo. Um, and, and so on that end, it gives me an advantage <coughs> over everybody else. And then the last thing is, um, if you do go to graduate school, or even while you're here in college, um, you really not need to start considering your career as soon as you can so that you can start doing extracurricular activities that really will further your career. So whether it's um, outreach and teaching, um, writing, so starting a blog is a great way to get started in writing, um, internships, um, those kinds of things, they're really things you should start thinking about as soon as you can. Um, as soon as you have any kind of glimpse of an idea of what you might want to do, just get out there and do it. Hello, Faith Ball. Uh, I'm an engineer, been an engineer my whole career, and I will tell you I absolutely love my job. I love it every day, not every minute of every day, but I love it every day, and I always have. What amazes me is that as I looked at statistics for women in engineering, out of all the engineering cur uh, curriculum, mechanical, the least women go into mechanical, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and I don't get it. It's the greatest career. It's fascinating for men and for women. So. Um, when I started school, though, when I went to college, I didn't start in engineering at all. And through high school, I was, I was interested in a lot of things, but there wasn't one passion. I liked math. I was good at math. I can't say I woke up and said I just wanted to do math all day. <laughs> I liked science. I did well in both. And it was actually my science teacher that came to me and says, you should go to school for science. I said, okay. He's my teacher. I'm going to do what he says. I did want to make sure I could translate that into a job. I had a hard time understanding how I go from college to a job, so I went into medical technology because I could envision what that is in a, in a career. So I started school at URI in medical technology, started taking all my basic classes, and I, what I realized is I was really gravitating towards the engineering classes, the physics, the math. Because they were easier for me, they, they were more like puzzles. Every single problem was a riddle, and I loved it. You know, you're trying to figure it out. It wasn't memorization purely, it was thinking through the logic you know, physics fascinates me and just walking through problems like that. So I was gravitated towards the engineering type classes, made some friends in engineering, and quickly changed my major to engineering. Um, and I chose mechanical purely because I, I need to see things. You can hand me something to take apart and figure out, and I'll do it without thinking. I'm kind of that person. I, the the um, computer science or the electrical is a little bit not as obvious to me. So I chose mechanical. Um, and absolutely think it's the best decision, one of the best decisions I've made in my entire life. 
Um, when I graduated, um, I quickly um, realized that uh, back then, it shows my age, we were actually doing pen and ink on Mylar. That's how we were designing. And I realized very quickly that computers were coming, 3D modeling was just coming. And so one of the companies north of Grumman was one of the first companies getting into the 3D modeling. So I moved across the country, moved to California. I grew up around here, moved to California to get into this 3D modeling, thinking I'd be there a year. Worked on the B2 for about 12, 13 years. Um, moved around into several things. Absolutely loved it. I'll tell you, the working out on a flight deck, working with airplanes, I've crawled all over the B2, working with friends that I've made through the years for years on, on these airplanes. It was really fascinating. I, I worked primarily on the structure of the B2, then got into systems, and they soon asked me to manage people. So I managed a department of engineers, and I realized I really liked that aspect. I wasn't the type of person that could sit at a computer and design all day long. I needed that interaction. I needed to multitask. I loved to multitask. I loved being part of people's careers guiding them, helping them make, move forward. I really enjoy seeing teams successful towards a common goal. So I really gravitated to the management side of managing technology, managing the people through challenges. Um, worked through several roles on the B2 program. I had my first child. And I'll tell you, you can do both. You can, I've had two children now. You can definitely work and have children at the same time. The company was open, I took my time off, came back, um, and I finally decided I wanted to move back east. My parents were around here, and I didn't like my parents flying 2,000 miles to see my girls, so I told my boss I was interested in trying to move back east. And I'll tell you, one of my lessons learned is always tell people what you want. Don't demand it, saying I'll leave tomorrow if you don't, but they don't know what you're thinking. They had no idea I wanted to move back east, and within a week I had an interview on the East Coast, and we moved a month later to the East Coast. Um, I was the director of engineering down in Annapolis, where we did submarines. So it was just being open with people about what your interests are, where you want to go, is one of my lessons to, to all of you. Um, worked there, got to know submarines, underwater vehicles, and then moved up to Baltimore and got to know uh, test equipment. So now I've had the design aspects from early development through test and integration, through test equipment. So I'm starting to see in a complete life cycle of a design and implementation of programs. Um, the other thing that was a little unique about me is that I was willing to move. Two things, I was willing to move, and my, family, my husband, God love my husband, because he moved to Maryland, never been there, ever, just moved. Um, and a lot of opportunities came up because I was willing to move. You know, they sometimes I would work for a big company that had a lot of sites, a site in every state. If they had a problem and they needed to some, send someone they knew, um, I would offer. I always raised my hands for, for taking any opportunity. I, I, if they needed anything done, I was willing to raise my hand, even if it wasn't in my, in my area. It's always an opportunity to learn. So we did move uh, several times, and finally they bought a site up in Massachusetts, which is where I wanted to be. It's where my parents were, where I wanted to ultimately live. So I offered to come up and help them run the site that they had just acquired. Um, so I did, and uh, that's kind of how I got up into the Boston, Massachusetts area. Um, so willingness to move, willingness to do things out of my norm. I really get excited with a lot of energy about trying something new, learning something new. One time they needed someone to close a site and move the people to a site nearby. I don't know anything about that at all, but I raised my hand to help you know, get through that. It, it just always gives you an opportunity to network. Network is absolutely critical. I knew more people at that company because I moved around and it helped me dramatically through my career. Um, so now I'm with Lockheed Martin right here in Marion. I live a block from my parents. My kids grew up with their grandma and grandpa. It's, I pinch myself every day. I couldn't have planned this better. And I had no plan. So <laughs> um, it's, it, I love what I'm doing. We're working now on underwater vehicles. Uh, weather balloons, we do sensors either in the air or under the water. Um, I've got uh, about 80 engineers that work for me. I love helping people through their careers. I love finding opportunities. I love working with teams and having a program come to, together successfully. That's what kind of uh, energizes me. Thank you. And with that, we'll pass it over to Vanessa. 
Okay, so I'll start at the end and then work my, then go back to the beginning. Um, so I work at a company called Mar Federal, and we make precision measurement equipment. Not that fun, but you never know. Um, the position I hold, actually, they recommend a master's degree. They require a bachelor's degree, but I actually have an associate's degree. So that's where I, I'm at now. Um, so just like everyone else, I don't think you kind of like wake up, you know, when you're little and you say, I'm going to be this when I grow up, and that's where you're, you are. You know, as when I was little, like most little girls, they kind of think about, like, I want to be a nurse, or I want to be a veterinarian, or something, or a hairdresser, or something like that, like more girly. And um, as I kept going, I have three older brothers, and the one that's closest to my age ended up going to a vocational school for high school. So I decided, hey, maybe I'm going to do that too. But I wanted to go in for maybe nursing, or I also was uh, interested in computers. When I went to high school, that high school, for computers, it was more like data processing. I, I didn't want to learn how to type or file. So at the vocational school I went to, you get to go through a program called exploratory, you go through a few different shops, and then at the end of it you get to pick. Well, I found out that I was really interested in machine. Um, I went into the machine technology area, which is you know, a greasy boy shop that you get to uh, cut metal and you do some math and you make stuff that you, you need, probably know how it even got made. So I, I got into that shop, I, um, I did pretty well, it was maybe two girls to 40, 40 students in total, so there was two girls and 38 boys. We still had a good time, it was fun, and, um, and then I saw some flyers for BCC to do um, a women in engineering camp. So I did that the summer from my freshman to sophomore year. And it was five, four days, three nights at UMass Dartmouth. And we had a lot of different teachers that taught us a bunch of different, you know, um, we did a mechanical engineering workshop, we did an electrical, uh, electrical engineering workshop, we did, um, you know, some computer things, we had some other uh, workshops that help us with how to network and how to present yourself and other things like that to help you start thinking about a professional career in maybe an engineering or technology background. So um, then our so my sophomore year, we, they actually, BCC used to do a program with high schools where they took vocational kids and they took traditional kids, all women, and put them on a team for uh, Texas Instruments. And the Texas Instruments would give these teams a real world problem that they had in their facility and the kids would come up with how to fix it, engineer it, make it themselves and present it at the end of the year. So I did that um, and I continued every summer um, to do the, the summer camp which then, um, you know, eventually unfortunately had, they had to stop the summer camp but I did it all my four years. Well, my senior year, I decided I want, you know, I'm sorry, actually my junior year, I decided I want to be a mechanical engineer. This is what I want to do. Um, I know about it. I love it. I know a lot of people now in the field that do it. I know what they do. So that's what I'm going to do. So I ended up going to BCC. Um, I also, because of the machine shop and being, I don't know if it was because I was non-traditional, but I ended up getting a co-op job at a company in the Cape. Um, do a machine shop. So I worked full time and I went to BCC part time. Um, that's, I actually started at BCC in 2001. It took me about six years to finish a two year degree. Um, but at the end of my two year degree, I had seven years of working experience. Um, with working with BCC and doing things like this, uh, like Katie said, networking, you now, I come here. I meet some more people, you're here, you're going to meet us. And every time you meet a new person that's in the field that you want to go into, that's another person that you can look towards when you need help, when you need mentoring, when you possibly need a job. 
or they might know of a job. Maybe where they work, there's no jobs, but they, you know, they have friends too, and they and they know the type of student that you are because of the passion and all these things that you go to. Um, so I ended up working um, at that job and moving into a drafting position, then into an engineering position. And uh, when I graduated, I I felt that I learned as much as I could at this company, and it was no longer going to be my most beneficial place. Because sometimes when you start at a company young, mm -hmm. you can't really move past that. Mm -hmm. You're just a little kid mentality to these to certain people. So I called my friends at BCC and I said, hey, I'm really looking for a new job. And um, it just so happened that one of the faculty members here used to work where I work. So they told me that they, there was some positions open and I applied, I, I got an interview, and um, I actually interviewed for a couple of positions, uh, two positions. They had a manufacturing engineer and a design engineer position open, and at the end of the interview, they asked me basically which one did I want. Um, because of all of the uh, classes I took at BCC, because of all of the um, things that I actually did at my previous job, it kind of just was beneficial that I, I basically could pick which one I wanted to do, because they were a little bit different. Um, and then as I became an engineer there, I worked there for a little while, and a position in product management opened in the same area. I do um, a product called air gauging, which basically uses air pressure to measure um, holes or outside of parts without actually touching the part, just by using air. And um, the product management position opened, and I applied for it, and um, and I got the job. And now I don't do as much designing and engineering, but it's more of um, you have to understand these concepts before you can um, help your customers. So you're really on the technical forefront with your customers, expressing to them what you can and can't do, and it's really what you want to take of it. I mean, there's certain things that I can send down to the engineering staff, and they do. Or I can just do it myself because I can. So it's more of a flexible position where I can take, um, I can do whatever I want and then rely on others. Or I can just, I don't have time for that or don't like this aspect of it. And I can always have someone else do it. And um, that's pretty much my story. <laughs> have heard some really interesting aspects about all their lives. Um, if you have questions, um, you can ask them generally in the group, or if you want to, you know, set them to a specific person, or if you don't feel comfortable asking them, if you want to just hand us the cards, we'll be happy to ask them for you. Um, so we'll kind of open it up to questions. All right, my engineering girls, I set you up ahead of time. <laughs> you're on the, you're on the mark. Go. All right, this is for when you graduated with your degree from mechanical engineering, they taught you everything you need to know. But when you go into your job, do you really feel like you're actually prepared for that job, or do you need a lot of additional training after that? that that's a great, great question. And my worry when I was sitting in your seats is that I wasn't sure I was ready because I couldn't imagine what it was like to be asked to go design something, right? Mm -hmm. You're not alone. They're going to set you up with people to mentor you. A, you have to learn new tools. The design tools I went to were different than what I learned in college. Everything about it, I didn't know anything about airplanes, nothing about structures. You're mentored through the whole thing. So um, don't worry about, and if, if you get to a place that doesn't mentor you like that, raise your hand and ask for help. I, there was never a point where I thought I was over my head that I couldn't get help, ever, still, to, to this day. Can I just add something to that? Sure. Um, and I also find that um, no, nothing's going to teach you what you need for a specific job, right. but college is more of teaching you how to get that information. Like, I, I need to do this task. I don't know how to do it specifically, but I know where to look. I know where to, who to ask. I know now what websites to check on that will help me further get to this point where I can understand what I'm doing. Right. That's yeah. great. Let me just ask one last thing because she yeah. triggered a great point. What, what engineering training did for me is it taught me to think. And you think that's funny, but today, when we have a failure of something, a product, we have to think through troubleshooting. 
I didn't know how to do that before school. School teaches you how to think logically, right? right. If you don't have that logical thought, but being an engineer in what I do is tough. So that's what engineering training did for me most out of anything, is it taught me how to think. You had another question, though, and I cut you off. Um, did you learn about vote by chance? Uh, yes. Yeah, I went there did you graduate? Did you graduate? 2001. Okay. Just curious. Mary, oh, go ahead. This one's for Ms. Pratt. How did you get over your, like, kind of, like, nervous breakdown? Because I know, like, some of us are, like, non-traditional students. I mean, we're already kind of feeling it. <laughs> oh, my gosh, there's no way I can do this. Like, how did you kind of work yourself through it? Um, I had a lot of support. So, um... My boyfriend was wonderful through the whole thing. Um, we lived together. It was like, you know, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> so, <coughs> anyway, he kind of um, picked me up off the floor several times and just was like, we'll do something about it, you know. But um, in all seriousness, I had professional help um, from like a therapist and a doctor. Like seriously, I turned to every possible form of help. Like I didn't do it. Uh, if I look at my CV or something, I look at it and I'm, I can see all the people who made all those things happen. I was there for it all, but did none of it on my own. And so really, make the most of everybody around you. And that goes for, for professionals, mentors, but also family, friends. And um, they'll really, and if someone gives you that tough love and just like, just do something about it then if you don't like it, just take that advice. Like sometimes you just be, I remember writing, writing articles like in the middle of the night because it was the only time I had. But <coughs> at the end of the day, doing that hard like work when I was like probably at my worst, it actually made, you know, gave me the opportunities that I have now. So there is an element of, getting the help they need, but also just telling yourself to buck up and do something about it. Hmm. I was wondering, as one of the teachers here, if you guys could speak, especially Rosie, your story kind of like mirrors this. Um, I'm chair of the biotech program currently, and we get a lot of people who are very willing to offer BCC students specifically internships, and these are kind of like new things to come into our program. And I'm a mother myself too, I know it's daunting to, you know, go and drag your kids to this daycare or that daycare so you can partake in this activity. But I was wondering if you guys could all kind of speak to the fact that it's worth stepping out of your comfort zone to maybe take a position that requires a commute or weird hours because that's, the, at least in my career, it was the stepping stone to getting to the position I'm at today. So I was wondering if you guys could speak to them about kind of like going outside your comfort zone to pursue that opportunity that might be a critical opportunity. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, I traveled over 3,000 miles to get that first job just because I knew I had to be there. I had to make myself available to them because, you know, you can, there's always going to be a line of people behind you vying for the same position. And you have to, at some point, you know, be able to step out of that comfort zone and do whatever it takes in order to be the front runner. Um, because I found when I've done that, it has paid off in the end. Yeah. For me, I, my my family has an opposite relationship. My husband actually stayed home with our three children for many years um, while I continued to pursue my career. And while you think on first blush, oh well, that can work. It is difficult, especially for a mom, to not be home with her children each and every day as they're beginning to grow. But it certainly worked for us for those several years that it happened. But it was something that, you know, I was committed to and my husband was committed to as well. So it worked for us, but it is a flipping, which I highly recommend because I think that women are important, you know, in the workplace and I think they contribute very much so and it, I, don't, I don't see a problem with the flipping of that relationship at all. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, the turning point where I just, you know, did something that was difficult was when I decided oh, I'm going to be a science writer. But I was already in a PhD program, and PhD programs are never part time. In fact, they're more than full time. Um, so it, what it meant for me was um, 
taking my free time and turning that into my second job. So luckily I could do that job at home on a computer, but um, for me it was a period of a couple of years of just solidly not doing very much fun stuff at all. I, I step out of my element a lot, and I find, I find it energizing, and I always learn, and I always meet people. On the daycare side, my daycare needs have changed throughout my career. I've gone with nannies, I've gone with day, you know, bringing to the daycare, and I've and my husband actually then re left work and is a stay-at-home dad now. Uh, we find that now they do all, he's a constant driving everywhere. <laughs> so and we balanced it depending upon what I needed. We decided to, my career would come first as I moved, you know, up in management. And um, so he kept working for quite a while until we moved local and decided that it was time for him to retire. And, okay. and I, I've never worked anywhere close to where I live. I always worked uh, 45 minutes to an hour away. Um, my current job, we have like 225 employees. I'm the only female in any management position at all. So um, you, you step out of your comfort zone every day just, to, you know. Um, not that men are um, daunting, but sometimes when you look around and, and you're the only one, it sometimes can say, like, oh, am I really saying this to all these guys? Yeah, I just have to. So I have something really positive to tell you all. The office I work in is predominantly women. So the life sciences at least tend to be getting more complete. Can you guys speak a little bit more to that? I'm sure, Faith, you, you see this. Um, but I. I was math and computer science all the way through school, all the way through my PhD. But um, I know I never found it incredibly daunting that I dealt with almost completely males in my classroom or when I was teaching or when I was just in class myself. But oftentimes I feel like sometimes girls may get a little intimidated. How do you find that strength or that ability, that confidence to stand up and say, um, I can do this, or how do you like? Do you do you have that? Do you have do you ever have a problem really in the workplace with anything like that? Both of you clearly are in. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very exciting topic too. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. It's more like uh, a task is asked or a question is asked, and you know you don't really think, oh hey, I'm the girl. You yes. think of like I know the answer. I'm just gonna say it because if we can sit here all day, or someone can answer the question. And you kind of just go for it, and then maybe after, when you're sitting at your desk by yourself, you're like, "Wow, I just, I just did that." You know what I mean? But it's, it's once you start doing it, it's, it's not a big deal. Maybe when you're in school and you're on a team with some guys, you might sit back a little bit and not be so much forward. But you'll find that the more you speak up and the more you don't allow yourself to be intimidated, the less you'll be intimidated. You'll kind of just say whatever you have to say and not even think about it. For me, I'm actually more comfortable with talking to a group of men than I am right now. <laughs> so, um, it, I don't think it was always like that, but it's just because that's all I do. I don't even think about it if I'm in a room with 200 men. It doesn't even, you know, and I, I um, but I'll tell you, I'm very excited for women entering the careers now because it's a whole different world. It's never been better. Employers are looking for diversity. They're looking for women. They're looking... And uh, people are treated just so much better than when I started working. It's, it's a whole different world. I'm very, very excited. Question in the back? Well, I just want to say that um, knowledge is power. And if you know the answer to a question, it shouldn't matter if there's men in front of you or women in front of you or whoever it is. If you know the answer, you know the answer. That's it. And just, you have to deliver. Yeah, and you can't be afraid. Sure you can't be afraid. Right. You have to lose that fear. Yeah. Lose that fear, forget it, just go and do it. When I had, um, when I was a student, some of my instructors here, uh, I was a mother, and um, I had my mother-in-law in the hospital, my husband in the hospital, and my daughter in the hospital all at the same time. All different hospitals. All different hospitals. Oh. <laughs> Actually, two of them were the same. One was in Boston. It's emotional, but I got through it, and I got all A's. <laughs> and I was doing homework at night, coming home from the hospital with a flashlight in the car. And yeah, I think that's a good key, is that I think that being women, we, we really have the ability to multitask. And 
have that confidence. And I tell you an example. You know, I used to be what I would call a screwdriver turner. So I was a tech type person. But then I began to rise into management. And at one point I recall someone saying to me, well, you don't know how to do that anymore. And it was a guy. I said, no, I don't know how to do it anymore, but you do, and that's why I have you. You know, and so you really have to feel comfortable in your own skin and be able to say, yes, I can do this, and this is why I'm here is because I can do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, a, it's a great experience. I think a really important thing is to find mentors to help you and help you through these hurdles. And I'm just wondering if you would, would all want to speak about how you found mentors or mentors that meant something to you and you know how these young women and men will find mentors for themselves. Anybody? Yeah, well, when I was at Bridgewater State um, I, and I was doing my independent research project, I had um, Jeff Bowen um, actually as my mentor and uh, Mary Kravosky. And they, um, I mean, Honestly, they are the ones that kind of brought out my interest, and um, and it was so, I guess, inspiring to me that when I went into my jobs, I was seeking it, you know. And when I came to Big Farm, I noticed that there was kind of a lack of mentorship, actually. And so, um, and I brought it up to the head of our department, who's a very intimidating male. But <laughs> you know, I went to him and I just said, look. You know, I come to work, I do my day-to-day -day stuff, but I, you know, I still need to develop and grow as a scientist, and I need a mentor. And so I started a mentorship program because there wasn't one in place. Um, so, yeah. I think the the uniqueness of particularly being someone that's in a traditionally male or and technical field, being able to straddle the strategy of being in an organization if you want to grow with that organization. I, um, a vice president that I worked for at another institution, he was, a, he was the ultimate strategist whenever it came to issues within an organization because I think if you, can get a, if you can get beyond and know what's going to work and how you establish relationships with people and how you promote those relationships with people, I think that in and of anything is the key to how I've gotten to where I am today. He really knew how to navigate this organization and just watching him and being able to learn from him helped me become what I am today. And it wasn't even the technical piece, it was being able to straddle the two, you know, being able to know enough about the technical side but also the people side and continue to motivate the technical people, give them the things that they can do to, to make things better, but also knowing that you have to, you have goals that you need to fulfill and customers that you need to help. So that, that's what has helped me. I was, I was lucky enough to have two very um, strong female scientists as my mentors. Um, my aunt, who I've obviously known my whole life, um, was a scientist. She got her PhD in chemistry in the UK and worked in cancer research and then in antibiotic research. And I, well, I, so to me, a woman scientist was normal, like my whole childhood, and I know that that is completely not a regular experience for most people. And then when I got to graduate school, I, the lab I joined was headed up by um, a woman um, who really, she kind of had it all. I mean, she has a wonderful family, she has a lab, she became the chair, department chair towards the end of my PhD. So I really got to see firsthand, you know, what it took to be a woman in science, but also um, what a successful woman in science looked like. So that, that was a really great um, mentorship experience for me. And then since, since starting writing, all the mentors I have just gone out and told, like found them, you know, and, and really looked at what they did and where they got, how they got to where they got. They may not even know that they're my mentors, really. Mm -hmm. I just kind of stalk them. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I've never fish, had an official mentor, but I, I work really hard at building great relationships with peers, with my bosses, with, with people, and I, learn, I watch. I'm quiet, I watch, and I learn from everybody. Mm -hmm. So I use everyone as mentors at some point, good and bad. Sometimes mm. you can learn more from the bad leaders than you can from the good. So, but what I did, I wish I had a female 
engineering mentor. And so I actually started a program at one of my jobs to mentor all the female engineers that were just starting. And the questions they'd ask, the basic questions, and I was just thrilled. I was able to, to help them get through answering some of those basics that I had to stumble on. That's the thing, you really have to just ask. If you identify someone who's, whose teaching style, you know, you really resonate, really resonates with you, just go up to them and ask. It can be informal, just like seek out those interactions because, you know, as the head of my department said when I went and was whining to him, he was like, a men you know, mentors aren't going to rain down on you. <laughs> if you want one, just go out and ask somebody. So. And to that point, there's nothing more flattering in the world <laughs> yeah. than having someone come up and say, I admire you. Mm -hmm. Will you mentor me? Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, she stole my thunder. I was going to say, uh, you know, you just can't be afraid to ask because no one's just going to see that you're struggling or need help. Um, you get business cards, you meet people. I mean, the internet's a great thing. You find out someone's name, you know where they work, you can find out how to call them or send them an email. Um, I've never had really a female engineering mentor. I've um, relied on some of the staff at BCC through my career, but I've also had some uh, a lot of male mentors that I've talked to and they've helped me and they've never said, oh hey, you can't do that, you're a girl. It's more like, this is what you need to do. Don't be afraid to do it, go. You know, so just don't, like they said, just don't be afraid to ask. If you have someone's name, your number, um, their email address, anything, you have a question, um, just ask, because the only thing they can do is say no, and then you move on to the next person. It was their loss. And I'll, I'll wrap that up with two things. You're going to hear no a lot in your life, so get used to it, and all it is is a word, and then you just move on and move forward from that one. That's the first thing. The second thing is they, they just spend a lot of time talking about mentors. Um, so you've heard people talk about me today. I just want to introduce you to the team of folks who helped put this on today because the next step that we're hoping to do is create some opportunities for women in STEM additional activities here at BCC. And one of those is creating mentor opportunities. And you have mentors right here at BCC in faculty and staff. And so if the different folks who've been in Division 5 want to just stand up and I'll introduce you very quickly, you've probably come across some of them at some point. Um, Zach is right here on the corner, followed by Mike, Sue McCourt, Katie, Mary Rapine, our real math geek over here, Beth Donovan, um, Mary Cass, uh, Mimi Kruger, and Dr. Pelletier. And there's a couple of additional faculty who aren't here today. And also, please, uh, over here, and not just division two kids, right. information right. sciences. You guys are all in this too. Um, it's also in the health sciences and all that. Exactly. So we also have um, Janelle Arruda. I was blanking there for a second. <laughs> and, and Priscilla Grosser. So again, these are folks that you folks can and always go. Look at our docs. <laughs> Pardon? Look at our docs. Yeah, look at our docs. So what we're going to do now is what you all really came for, which is the ice cream social. <laughs> so we are, we're in the process. We're just going to move across the hallway over here. And what we did ask you guys to do is you do have on your name tags colored dots. And everybody up here doesn't have colored dots, but you know who they are now because you've just spent the last hour listening to them. And we're going to just be setting up in the room. Please take this opportunity to sit and talk with folks. Go, you know, ask those additional questions that maybe you didn't have time to ask here that you really want to know about, or just hear more about what they do in their field, how they got to where they are. This is really for you guys, the students. And then the last thing I do want to say is, um, for some of you, um, if you don't have my email, I can certainly get that to everybody. But we are also looking to do one additional activity that we're proposing for right after final and if folks might be interested in it. We still have to kind of figure out the logistics of it, but we've toyed with this idea of doing a one-day field trip down to New York City to visit the um, Museum of Air and the Air and, and the Museum of Math. I can't leave that. <laughs> to do the Museum of Math and uh, visit the, uh, Air and, the Air and Space Museum on the Intrepid. Look at them. They're like, oh my God, there's a whole museum of math. I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> So if that's something that actually would make you guys think like, oh, that's something cool I'd like to do, that is definitely something we're looking at. We do it right after finals, so probably the week after, but we need to know who has an interest so that we can determine what it would take to make that happen. Um, so with that, I want to just ask for a second round of our final round of applause for our panelists today.